So this morning we're going to pick up where we left off with the sixth commandment. This is the commandment, you shall not murder. It's Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 13. So if you want to pull that up in your Bible or your Bible app these days, they have those things now. You can do that. Exodus 20, verse 30, you shall not murder. And so last time in part one of this sermon, uh, we discussed how murder can be performed with these things that are here on the screen, with the hands, with the mind, with the tongue, with the pen, by plotting the death of another, by consenting to the death of another, and by not hindering the death of another when it's within your power to do so, and by not executing the law upon capital offenders. In other words, not punishing those who do the murders. So we discussed those last time and had some explanation of what those were. And if you didn't hear that sermon, you could go and visit our YouTube channel and, and watch it there. But we also looked at different types of murder, and that might be kind of small for you, but it's best I could do to get it all there on one screen. But we looked at homicide, which is the deliberate, willful, wanton, malicious, malevolent taking of human life by another human being. And I was careful to point out that not all hom homicides are murders, but all murders are homicides. So there's a lot of different kind of crimes within the the umbrella of homicide. So there's homicide, then there's suicide, which is self-murder, when a person kills himself. It's not the unpardonable sin, as many have thought through the years, and some are still teaching today. It's not the unpardonable sin. But within the umbrella of suicide includes things like euthanasia, which is physician-assisted suicide, or, you know, uh, doctor-assisted suicide. Then there's genocide, which is ethnic cleansing. There's sinicide, which is the murder of senior adults. There's infanticide, which is the murder of a child within its first year of birth. There's abortion, which is murder in the womb. There's poison, and under that is like drugs. People are dying from the use of illegal, illicit, just drugs that will kill you. Uh, and then knowingly selling and distributing bad food, you know, knowingly doing it, knowing it can hurt people. Complicity in alcoholic poisoning and unsafe work conditions, etc. those types of things. Then there's attrition, which is psychological murder. It's killing someone little by little, wearing them down over time. Um, in action, not doing what you should be doing to deter and dissuade murderers and to protect the citizenry. So, and at the end of the last sermon we had on murder, we closed the service out with an appeal that there is hope for anyone who's broken this commandment in any way. And the hope is found in Jesus Christ. We broke God's law and Jesus paid our fine and we can go free and be forgiven because of what Jesus has done through us, for us, through his perfect, righteous, obedient life and through his sacrificial atoning death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. So Jesus, interestingly, if you think about it, Jesus not only paid our fine at the cross through his blood, but the Bible says he's also our advocate. He's our lawyer before the Father, pleading our case to him that we are righteous in Christ, not in ourselves. And I'll speak more about this later, but please understand that there is hope. If you've committed this crime or broken this commandment in any way, there is hope for you, for your soul, because with God, all things are possible because of Christ. And so today we're going to get into some other matters related to this commandment of you shall not murder. And what I'm going to start with is discussing what murder is not. Okay, last week or two weeks ago, we started focusing more on what it is. Today, 
Let's look at what it's not. What murder is not? The death penalty is not murder. War is not murder, generally speaking. I'll explain these in a minute. Self-defense is not murder. Killing animals is not murder. Not all hate is sinful or murder, even though the Bible does say if you hate your brother, you're guilty of murder. Not all hate speech is hate speech or murder, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit too. But let's look first of all at the issue of the death penalty. The Bible is pretty clear. Back all the way in the very beginning, God had to set this forth in Genesis chapter nine, verse six. He says that whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed for in the image of God, he made men. So if you take another person's life, which is only the right and the prerogative of God, God's the one who decides when you're born, God's the one who decides when you die. That's God's right. And if you take another person's life and you take what belongs to God into your own hands, the Bible says that you forfeit your right to live. You are a manslayer and should receive justice from the hands of the government. In fact, the government proves itself to be against the prosperity and safety of its citizens and does not value them or their lives by not upholding the law consistently for all. The government does not serve and protect when it does not uphold and enforce. So the, there is a place for the death penalty. And when it is rightly administered, it's not murder. Number two is self-defense. Taking a life in self-defense is not forbidden when anyone for the purpose of defending his own life against a violent and unjust aggressor kills another person. For self-defense to be lawful, for it to truly be self-protection, it is necessary for these following things to happen that the aggressor unjustly assails you, that the defender has no other means of escape, that the defense is made during the very attack and not after it's over, and that nothing is done by the defender either under the impulse of anger or with the desire for revenge but with the sole intention of defending himself. That's when self-defense is not murder. If it's self-defense, it's not murder. But if it's, uh, if, if, if someone says, well, I have to preserve my honor, I have to fight for my family's name, or uh, if, if maybe a gang member says, oh, well, I've got to, you know, it's, it's about who we are. Uh, then it's not self-defense, it's murder. It's wrong to use self-defense when the issue is the preservation, uh, when the issue is the preservation or the recovery of honor. Honor can be recovered, but life never can be. Killing in this situation would involve unlawful revenge, and the Bible says not to take revenge. The Bible says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So the issue should be the defense of life, not revenge. Um, and then there's war. War is acceptable when a government attempts to protect its citizenry by avenging evil. Look with me in Romans chapter 13 in the New Testament. Romans 13, verse 4, and we'll see what the Bible says about this. Uh, 
Romans 13, I'll start in verse 3, 3 and 4. It says, um, for rulers, that's the governing authorities, are not a terror to good works, but to evil. In other words, if you're doing right, and living morally and justly, and you're obeying the law, you shouldn't have any reason to fear the government. <laughs> With that, we could get into that some. But generally speaking, you know, you know, rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authorities? Do what's good and you will have praise from the same. Verse four, for he, the authority, is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. So this sixth commandment that we're looking at and about murder, in fact, all the commandments pertain to everyone, whether they're believers or not. So in this case, non-Christian magistrates are responsible to punish evil and reward good as much as a Christian leader that's a magistrate would, would have to do. And when it comes to war, war is an escalation of the thinking behind the death penalty and self-defense on a massive scale. That's what war is. But for war to be acceptable, it must be a just and necessary war. Unjust and immoral wars due to someone's or some country's selfish ambition or greed for wealth or gain or hatred of another race of people. Those kinds of wars are no better than burglary and theft. And it always includes stealing and murder and hate and very often genocide. And so it's the duty of the magistrate to defend his people against unjust violence, which cannot always be done without war. Sometimes you got to, there has to be. He has been given the sword as the avenger of crimes. And listen, if small robberies committed against a few are rightly punished, how much more should great public robberies by those who endeavor to lay waste entire regions be punished. The magistrate is bound to undertake the defense of his people to care for the public peace and safety and to guard his country and his laws against those who strive to destroy them. And sometimes this cannot be done without the right to wage a just war. Now, what is a just war? Not all wars are just wars. Some wars are just murderous and they're not righteous. So Christians down through the ages have wrestled with this idea of war and if it's ever acceptable. And there's some Christians who've landed on the side of peace. They're, they're peacemakers no matter what, all the time that war is always wrong to them and so for them they would never fight in a war. And then there's others who are like, no, sometimes it's just, it's right, it's okay to fight to defend people who haven't done anything, who are being unjustly persecuted or whatever the case might be. So war is the use of lethal force. In wars, people do get killed, people do die. And the Christian's worldview understands that in a fallen world, warfare is sometimes necessary, but it has to be defensive. Don't be the offensive. Don't be the defender. Don't be the one who starts the war. It has to be righteous over against an unrighteous aggressor. And so the six principles, uh, I thought I put that on there. Guess not. The six principles associated with just war theory are it must number one, have a just cause. 
Number two, it has to be the last resort. You don't go to war just off the very first thing. It has to be last resort after all other efforts for peace have, been fa have failed. Number three, it has to be declared by a proper authority. In other words, you can't just start a war on your own. It has to be done the right way. Number four, you have to have the right intent. Like there has to be a good reason for it. And that's sort of just cause. It goes along with that one. Uh, number five, having a reasonable chance of success. You don't want to go to war if you're going to lose and then more people that shouldn't die end up dying. And then number six, the, the end being proportional to the means. That is, lethal force is to be used against combatants, not against citizens. You don't go to war and try to kill civilians. You're only fighting against armies, navies, military, not civilians. So that's the just war theory that's been developed over the years. But then the, the killing of animals is not murder either. Using the word murder to describe the unlawful killing of animals is just another way to blur the crucial distinction between humans and animals. There is a difference. Animals can certainly be abused and that is wrong. And such abusers should be prosecuted. But animals cannot be murdered. They are not people, only people can be murdered. But then let's talk about hate. Because we did learn before that you can murder someone in your mind, you can wish they were dead, you can think of how you would take them out if you had the chance, those sorts of things. But not all hate is sinful. And let me explain that. You're gonna to have to kind of track with me if you can. Let's be sure that we're hating something, something that is sinful and not someone who is sinful. Because all of us are sinful. <laughs> all right, nobody's perfect, we just start there. Let's be sure that when we're hating, we're hating something and not someone. It's often very difficult for us to separate the sin from the sinner. In fact, we're told in the Bible that our war as Christians is not against flesh and blood, but it is against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's where the war is. That's where the battle is. It's not against people, one another. Sometimes it's manifested that way. But when it comes to eternal matters, we are not judge and jury. God is. And so let's insist upon and encourage righteous and obedient living for those who claim to be Christians, particularly within our own church, while realizing that God is the ultimate judge. Let's do our best to love what God loves and hate what God hates. So with this idea of not all hate is sinful, look at this verse here, these verses from Proverbs. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift and running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. We need to love what God loves and we need to hate what God hates. So not all hate is necessarily murder. And then, not everything that's called hate speech is hate speech, and therefore it's not murder. Sometimes it's simply the truth that someone doesn't want to hear. And let me tell you what I mean by this, because that's a term you hear a lot today is hate speech. There is some speech that's hateful, and we hear it a lot. Speech that I won't even give you examples of because I don't even want to come close to being offensive. 
And I'm talking about speech that wishes someone was dead, that wants to hurt and harm someone because they look a certain way, or they think a certain way, or they vote a certain way, or they belong to a certain race, or because they don't check all the boxes that you think they should check. It's never right, it's never necessary, it's never acceptable, and such speech should never be spoken by anyone, especially by Christians. In fact, the Bible says that our speech should be loving and gracious, seasoned with salt and appropriate to the moment. Our speech should be truthful. As far as it depends on you, the Bible says, to be at peace with all men. Amen. Don't be mean. Don't purposefully say hateful things. Default to sharing the truth in love and grace. The Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. Love not the world, nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Don't respond and react like the world does. Now, I am unapologetically, theologically conservative. That's me. Because the Bible, because I believe it, and I read it, and I trust it, and because I am theologically conservative, it affects every area of my life. And that includes ethics, morality, politics, everything in my life. I strive to be consistent at home and at work. If you watch me, I hope you see the same guy here that you see when I'm at home or when I'm out in the community that I'm the same person, whether it's before friends or among foes or in my neighborhood or at church, I work hard to not be hypocritical in any area of my life. But there are many people today who have been told and believe that if someone is conservative, that they hate people that they want to commit racial genocide or sexual genocide against those with whom they disagree. And to that, I will just simply and politely say, that's just not true. I don't hate anyone. I can't. God won't let me. It's not in my heart. And I don't want God to test me on this either. I'm not asking for that. I don't want God to put me in a position to where I might be tempted to hate somebody. I, I don't want that. I care about people. And I love people. And you know, the way that I do it might not look like the way Pastor Sam loved people. Because God wires us all differently. All of us are different. But listen, disagreeing with someone about something is not the same thing as hating them. Some of us could have disagreements about how things ought to be done in the church. Doesn't mean we hate each other. Some of us might have disagreements about gun control or climate change, and that's okay. I'm sure that I can understand why you might take a different position than I did. And in some cases, it's not a matter of who's right and who's wrong. It's just a difference of opinion. We have disagreements in our family sometimes. I'm sure you don't. Spouses disagree, right? Um, Paul and Barnabas disagree, but they didn't hate each other. So because I value the gospel over politics, because I value Jesus over everything else, I try to really be careful when it comes to what I post online and how I say what I say. And what I'm telling you right now, I've even tried to be careful in how to say what I'm saying. 
So when it comes to politics and culture, I try not to make a big deal about it. I don't put up political signs in my yard because I don't want to alienate my neighbors. I don't want to put a stumbling block in the way of them hearing the gospel. They might think, oh, well, that guy, he's whatever. I'm writing him off right now because I don't want to listen to him. But I will speak to issues insofar as the Bible speaks to it. And in my prophetic role as a pastor, sometimes I have to speak out about things that clearly go against the will of God as revealed in the scripture. And I will tell you, if you don't know already, that I am not going to participate in the mass delusion that's going on in this country right now when it comes to truth, love, and sexual morality. I'm not gonna go along with it. It's a social contagion. It's peer pressure run amok. And when we listen to the media, we're told that if we don't go along with it, if we don't affirm them in whatever, that they will kill themselves. I don't believe that. By the way, we're not on a rabbit trail right now. You might think we are, it might seem like it, but we're talking about the commandment that forbids murder. And we have been told by others that to disagree with someone who believes something that is not true will cause them to kill themselves. Are you tracking with me? But that's not true. And we are not accomplices to murder by not affirming someone in his or her delusion. Do you wanna know why so many people are killing themselves today? It's not the conservatives or the Christians fault. It's because of the lies they're being told. And it's what they end up believing about sexuality, love, and truth. I want you to try to listen to this. When you have so many young people, especially young people, addicted to social media, listening to influencers, reading articles and watching videos that feed them with more lies than the truth. And when you get addicted to doing whatever it takes to get likes and views and affirmation, and when you add to that evolutionary teaching that we're nothing more than glorified animals, and when you add to that the devaluation of human life, abortion is freedom, women. It's all about freedom. Uh, suicide is okay because you might need to just escape. It's a way of escape. Uh, video games that encourage violence and killing. Where rarely does anyone die in a video game. If you do, you simply respawn to fight again. I mean, the game doesn't just destruct when you die in the game. And when you add to that the 80 plus types of genders people claim there are, you confuse a generation of people who haven't even reached adulthood mentally or physically and who already have a hard enough time with their own concerns about body issues, pimples, cliques, cool kids, hoods, and nerds, whatever they call them today, I don't even know. But do you wanna know what is hate speech? It's telling someone something that isn't true that could affect and alter their life in so far that they take an action that could have detrimental effects on them later in life. That's hate speech, lying to them. So much of what kids are being told today about sex and love and life is tearing them apart. It's not our lack of affirmation and participation with them in a lie that increases the likelihood of them committing suicide. It's actually the opposite. It's perpetuating a lie, pretending that up is down, bad is good, men can be women and women can be men, and all that other stuff that's going on out there is confusing them, causing them to make terrible life-altering decisions that many of them will regret, and all of the other pressures that they face at that stage in their life is what causes many of them to feel confused and hopeless. They don't know what to do. 
They don't know where to turn. They've been told, don't go to church. That's a bunch of hooey. Don't listen to your parents. Eh, they're outmoded. They live in the dinosaur age. Listen to us, you know. But here's the thing. When you leave out truth, you end up with lies and error. The devil uses lies to kill, steal, and destroy people. He does it every day. He does it all the time. He's done it since the very beginning of time. So much of what's going on in our country is evil. It's demonic. And our country is facing a spiritual attack that I don't think we even recognize because we're so far removed from God and his word. All the violence, all the murders, the suicides, the shootings, and sexual confusion is crazy. And I think that the primary explanation for it is a demonic influence over our country as a result of us reaping what we have sown as a nation. You can only reject God and his truth for so long before it comes back to bite you. And the antidote to all of the terrible, tragic things going around us, the only antidote is truth. God and his word. Hearing it, believing it, obeying it, trusting in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That's the cure for what ails this country. There is hope. I mentioned this earlier. The solution is Jesus. The devil, the father of lies, Satan, comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. And at our core, I believe most of us yearn for law and order. We want things to be made right. We want there to be justice. We want there to be, we just want God to fix it. It's a yearning that we know is not just in our heart because it's a civilizational thing. It's there because God made us in his image. And as a God who is totally righteous and totally just, he puts a desire for justice and for law and order in our hearts. So listen, Christian, listen. Your desire for right to reign and for wrong to be eliminated points to the reality that justice is reachable only by the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who will come again and he will execute justice in his own way which will be perfect and total it will be comprehensive and final. And until that day when he comes, we have to struggle with seemingly insurmountable complexities in a world of seemingly interminable evil, but also full of much good. Sometimes our main responsibility is not to try and explain all of this or even understand it all, but like Job in the Old Testament, sometimes we just need to tear our clothes and grieve. But that grieving will not last forever. But in this life, in this existence, it's real. And it's real right now in Allen, Texas, and in Columbus, Ohio, and in Ocean Springs, Mississippi, in Mount Pleasant, and Saginaw and other places. So let's pray for the grieving people of these places, for that community, prayer for the families affected, prayer especially for the days ahead, and we also pray for God's protection over all people everywhere. We pray for God's righteousness and justice to be manifest even in this fallen world as best as humans are capable. And it also reminds us that we are to pray as Christians instructed by the scripture to pray, even so, Lord, come quickly. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do bow before you. And Lord, we do know this world is broken. And we know why. It's not because of anything you've done, Lord, but because of 
humanity's choices to ignore you and your word. And Father, we pray for those grieving in Allen, Texas, and Columbus, Ohio, Ocean Springs, Mississippi, Mount Pleasant, Michigan, and Saginaw. From the smallest to the largest. God, for you to comfort these families and that maybe in some way through this the gospel could be shared and people could be saved. Lord, we do want you to come quickly. Thank you that you have provided the antidote for this and that's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, as we close out this morning, as we sing this last hymn, Lord, help us to do whatever you're telling us to do, whether it's to go out and be more bold to live for you, not in a mean way, but in a loving way. Or, Lord, maybe you're calling someone to salvation today in the Lord Jesus Christ or whatever it might be, Lord, whether it's maybe someone feels led to join the church today or you just have your will and your way among us. And we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Our uh, closing hymn today.